my awesome algebra students. Unfortunately, I can't be with you today, so you get to listen to my voice and we'll be going through lesson two of unit two together. Would you please have your books out and open them up to page 138. On page 138, we have, and I can write that up here in case you weren't there yet, page 138. Um, <clears throat> we just have a quick little warm-up problem. Um, it's asking about different percents and all of the numbers that I'm going to give you. Um, you can see all four of the questions in your book, but all of them are about using 200 instead of just 100. So if I was trying to find 25% of 200, um, there's a couple of ways you can do this, right? You can be thinking about, well, what's one fourth of 200, because that's what 25% is. Or you could think about what's 25% of 100, which would be 25, and then 25% of 200 would be two times that. Right, so it's going to be 2 times 25, which is going to give me 50, which is also 25% or 1 fourth of 200. Now, the reason that I think I like thinking about this in terms of 100 or 100 per um, when we're finding these percents uh, is because now that I've got a problem like 12%, that one wouldn't be as easy to do just in my head, but if I can think about 12% of 100, that would be 12. And because this is 200, it's twice as much. So I'm going to have 2 times 12, which is going to give me 24 for my total on that one. 8% is going to be 2 times 8, right? Because 8% 8 of 100 would be 8, and 8% 8 of 200 would be twice as much. So this is going to be 16. The last one, if we hadn't been thinking about it that way, could be a little bit tricky, right? But I want you to see this pattern. The first one was two times the 25% that I was looking for, and then it was two times 12%, and then two times 8%. If this is just some number that I don't really know what it is, but because it's out of 200, I can say it's gonna be two times as much as whatever that percent was. So this is just gonna be 2p for my answer. Okay, because I'm not in class with you today, we're going to be skipping part of this lesson. Uh, it doesn't really help, in my opinion, in terms of what you would need to know. They've got some really cool pictures there and a doodecahedron, which is a cool word to say, but we're going to skip over those platonic solid questions and move on to the top of page 140. So this is, and I can write that up here for you also, page 140, about blueberries for some of the questions and about earnings for some of the questions. And realize if I was there in class with you, we would be doing this and I would have more of a discussion where you guys are giving me all the answers and unfortunately I just can't be there with you today. Um, so for letter A, it says blueberries are $4.99 a pound and Diego buys B, pounds of blueberries and he pays $14.95. Now this just says write an equation to represent the situation. I'm not asking you to solve this. I don't need you to tell me how many pounds of blueberries he bought even though I'm sure that some of you can figure that out. What I want you to do right now is write an equation. So if it's $4.99 a pound and he buys some number of pounds, I would take well, if we're working with blueberries, we should probably have blue, right? Um, $4.99 times B, however many pounds he bought, would give me the total cost, which was that $14.95. By the way, when you're writing an equation, I am perfectly fine with not having dollar signs in the equation. Um, when we would solve this, if we would solve this, we would want a label on the answer, but the label wouldn't be dollars anyway. Part B says blueberries are still $4.99 a pound. Jada buys a different number of pounds, P pounds, and she buy, and she pays C dollars. So 
a little bit less information is given to us this time. I don't know how much money she actually spent. So this one I really couldn't solve. But because we wrote that first one, you should be able to write an equation that's similar to that. Would you take a moment, please? Try to write that equation. You got all the stuff in the right places from the first one. Just try to substitute these in, right? This should be 499. And we use a different variable here. She's got P pounds. And this time, I don't know how much she paid. She paid, that's how much it cost. That's, that was how much money she spent. All right, so letter C, I'm gonna take away even more information. Blueberries are hmm, some amount, D dollars a pound. Lynn buys Q pounds of blueberries and pays T dollars. Now, if I started with that problem instead of parts A and B, this one might be a little bit difficult to write, but because I kind of have my setup from the first two, I can say, well, blueberries are D dollars a pound. Up above it was $4.99 a pound, but let's say it's this many dollars for every pound, and she buys, well, these other two were about how many pounds they bought, so she's going to buy Q pounds, and the total cost well, in A, it was $14.95. In B, we would just use C for the cost. Here, it's going to be T for the total cost. All right? Each time, it gets a little bit more general. Today, we're writing equations and trying to write uh, an equation that could be used in more situations. All right, D, E, and F are a little bit different questions. They're not about blueberries. It says Noah earned N dollars over the summer and my earned $275, which is $45 more than Noah did. So by the way, there's more than one way to be writing these equations. But I just, again, if I was there with you, we would definitely talk about other options. But um, since we're starting with Noah, I'm going to say Noah earned that much. And my earned $45 more than Noah did, and I know what her total was. So I would do N plus 45 gives me my's total, which is 275. All right, make sure that you're writing these down. Letter E says Noah earned V dollars over the summer. My earned M dollars, which is $45 more than Noah did. So again, we've got the right setup. Noah earned this much. My earned $45 more than him. So we're going to add 45 to get her total. This time we just don't know what her actual total is. We're going to say that she earned M dollars. And for letter F, Noah earned W dollars over the summer. My earned X dollars, which is Y dollars more than Noah did. And again, if we started with this one first, this could be kind of tricky, but we've got that setup going already. So we're gonna say Noah earned this much money, W, and my earned this much more than he did. So we're gonna add that on to get my's total, okay? Question two says, how are the equations you wrote for the blueberry purchases like the equations you wrote for Maya and Noah's summer earnings, and how are they different? Well, and at first it might seem like they don't really have a whole lot in common, right? We've got blueberries and we've got money that they earned over the summer, but um, the, the different kinds of equations, the blueberry equations and the earnings equations, they both had, both of those types had three quantities that we were using. Um, the first equation had one unknown, and then we had two unknowns in the next one, and then three unknowns. That's what happened in both of those situations, right? So it can be, we can be talking about how many known values we had or unknown va va um, values we had. Things that are different, um, the first ones are all about just unit prices, pounds of blueberries and the cost. Second one's about the earnings of two different people. Like in that way, they're very different situations. Um, also, the first three problems that we had were all using multiplication 
and the next ones we're all using addition. So whichever things you want to be thinking about for how they are alike and how they're different, you can jot that down for number two. All right. Now we've got some information about car prices. It says the tax on the sale of a car in Michigan is 6%. At a dealership in Ann Arbor, a car purchase also involves $120 in miscellaneous charges. So that would be very typical. In fact, I would say that it's probably a lot more than that usually when you go to buy a car. But there's just other charges that they might have to have besides just what the dealership would be charging you. So for these questions, I've got, um, it says there are several quantities in this situation, the original car price, sales tax, miscellaneous charges, and the total price. Write an equation to describe the relationship between all these quantities when, and then they give you some different information. Um, by the way, we talked last week about how to work with that 6%. So that should help us out a little bit here. And I'll probably do some of these problems one time. We'll do it. Maybe this first one I'll do with just the 6%. And then um, I'll do part B using that 1.06 to just kind of add it on right away. So you can see the difference in the two. So I'm looking for the total price of the car. Let's use T for the total price. The total price here, let's switch colors, the total price has a couple of things, right? We've got the cost of the car, which is 9500 in this case, plus we have to pay that sales tax, which is 6% of 9500 So 6% as a decimal is going to be 0 0.06 times 9500 and we have to pay that miscellaneous charge, that extra $120, right? So that's an equation for that first one. Second one, different car. This one costs a little bit more. We've got this car that's $14,699. Um, let's do this one where we do that shortcut with the tax. We could write it exactly the same way, by the way. We could put this new cost in where we've got that 9,500 and our equation would be just fine. But I'm gonna write this one to say that the total cost is going to be, I'm gonna do 1.06 and I'll remind you again why that works, times that 14,699. So that's the cost of the car plus the tax. That 1.06 is really 106%. So you're paying 100% of the car, plus another 6% for tax. And then we still have to add on that $120 miscellaneous fee. Okay, for letter C, it gives us the total price of the car after everything's all added up. But I don't know what the original car price is this time. So we would need to use some variable. Um, I, I guess I kind of like and I can see in D they're going to use P for the price, but let's just use price for this one also, P for price. The total they're giving us is 22,480 equals, uh, let's do this kind with the 1.06. So it'll be 1.06 times whatever the original price was that I don't know, I don't have that information. But I know that I still paid that $100, $120 miscellaneous fee. Okay, for D, it says, what if the original price was just some variable, right? That looks very much like, um, what I have here, except I don't know what the total price is. It's going to be almost exactly like C, but I would say the total price is going to be 1.06 times the original cost of the car plus 120. Okay. 
Number two says, well, how could I change or what would each equation be if we would change the sales tax instead of being 6%? What if it was R percent? and the miscellaneous charges were M dollars. Well, the M dollars wouldn't be a hard change, right? All of the 120s could just change to Ms. The 6% is a little bit tricky because, or the, I'm sorry, the R percent is a little bit tricky because you can't just say, well, it's gonna be 0.0 R. Well, that's, that doesn't make any sense. We can't have a variable in as the number part of the decimal. It just doesn't work. So I might have to rewrite this as a fraction. I'm not going to redo all of these. Let's do, um, let's do letter D. And I'm going to say we would actually have to do letter D kind of that longer way with the two separate parts. So let's do this for letter D. It would be the total price would be the original cost of the car plus R percent, I would have to write as a fraction. And I know everybody loves fractions, right? Um, any percent we just put over 100. So this would be R over 100. That's supposed to be a 100 right there times the original price right we could put that in parentheses if that makes it a little more comfortable for you plus whatever the miscellaneous charge is you could certainly go back and do that for all of your equations there I just did that for letter D but that R over 100 is what we would need to use instead of R percent. We can't just change that into a decimal number. Okay, so we have some of those equations that we just were writing, and I want to be able to um, answer some of these questions. So these first two questions go with the two equations up on the top. It says in the first equation, what quantities do we know? Well, we know almost everything, right? We just don't know the what, what the actual total cost is going to be. We know what the original cost of the car was. We know that it was 6% tax. And we know the miscellaneous um, cost for that fee was $120. Um, this would be really helpful for this one if you knew exactly which car you were going to go buy and you wanted to know how much it was going to cost so you could make sure you had a loan for instance in the exact amount that would be really helpful right there in the second equation when i don't have very much information like i don't know what this t is i don't know what the original price is this would be helpful um, by the way this I don't think these questions are actually in your book if you're looking for them. I'm sorry if you're getting confused on that. Um, we know we know that there's a $120 fee. We know that there's a 6% sales tax, but we don't know the other stuff. That might be helpful though if, let's say, you work at the dealership and you want to be able to figure out the cost of a car for somebody, you would want to have an equation like this to say, oh, all I need to know is figure out what the what the original price is of the car that you want. We're going to put that in for those P's right there. And then we would be able to just take out a calculator, crunch some numbers quick, and we could find the total cost. So that might be useful. When might that be useful? If you were trying to be able to figure out what the total cost was, if you knew um, that you might have different people coming in for different cars and you just wanted to have that kind of set up. All right. For these two, in the first equation, it says, what quantities do we know? Well, this one is back to the original car. Oh, there's an extra zero there. Ignore that guy. Um, $9,500 for the car. Um, but the things that we don't know is, I don't know what the actual percent is for the sales tax and I don't know what that miscellaneous fee is. This would be helpful um, if you if you knew which car you were gonna be going in and you knew what you which one you wanted to buy. Um, but that's all that we know is just the, the original cost. If you don't know what the 
sales tax is, for instance. Maybe they've got a different sales tax in a different county and you're you know, going into a different county. You might want to have an equation set up like this so you could figure it out. You might realize, yep, I know there's going to be a miscellaneous fee. I just don't know what it is yet. In the second equation up here, it says, what quantities do we know? Well, in fact, in this one, we don't know anything. This is the equation most likely that you'd be using if you didn't even know what percent the sales tax was, right? You could use this and say, I know which car I like. I'm going to put in my price of the car. And then when I figure out what the sales tax is, what that rate is, and what the miscellaneous fees are, then I can actually use that to figure out my cost. But all of these different equations have different places where they might be really helpful. It just depends on which information you have and what you're trying to do. Okay, so this is not in your book either. Um, just trying to keep track of what what you can see and what you can't see, because this is the lesson synthesis. When we get to the summary, you'll be able to see that. Um, you know that we use numbers and letters to represent quantities in situations, right? We use variables, that's our letters. Um, sometimes it makes sense to only use numbers if you actually know all the numbers. Sometimes it makes sense to use letters when we're trying to set up a very general um, kind of an equation so we could use it for a whole bunch of different things. In theory, and I know that I didn't say this phrase today, but in theory, maybe you've heard this, a quantity that varies or a quantity that stays the same. A quantity that varies is just a variable. Um, and then a, a, vari a quantity that stays constant, I didn't underline the constant before, is called a constant. That's just a number. So in the car problem, we would know if it was a $120 miscellaneous fee, regardless of what kind of car you bought, that's a constant. It's always going to be the same cost for everybody. The quantity that varies would be the price of the car. Not everybody's going to come in and buy the exact same car and know exactly that they are going to spend exactly this much money on a car, right? Some people are going to have a less expensive car. Some people are going to want a car that costs more. So that would be the quantity that varies. This is in your book. This is on page 142. If your class was planning a trip to the museum and the cost of admission is $7 per person, the cost of renting a bus for a day is $180, um, we could kind of take a look at how we could write some different equations here. It says if 24 students and three teachers are going, we know that the cost would be, well, it'd be $7 for each student, that's this part, and $7 for each teacher and the bus. Right, the bus is going to be the same no matter what. Or we could kind of put those teachers and students because it's seven dollars per person, it doesn't matter if it's a teacher or a student. We could put that together and have this. If there are 30 teacher or 30 students and four teachers, well, then it would look like this, right? We can change how many students and how many teachers are going. The number of students and teachers can vary. We can change that. The cost of admission doesn't change though. It's $7 every time. The, to the total cost of the trip is going to change also be depending on how many people are going. Um, but letters are going to be really helpful when we're trying to represent some things. So the cost of the whole trip would be $7 for every student and every teacher plus the bus. Remember that bus, that's going to be a constant amount. It costs 180 bucks for the bus. You don't get a discount if you don't fill the bus up. You have to pay for the whole bus no matter what. And then it says that some quantities can be fixed. That's what I was just saying. The bus is going to be $180. So letters can be used to represent quantities that are constant. And sometimes we do that. So you can see that right here they used a B for the bus. Yeah, what happens if next year maybe the bus costs a little bit more? Or if gas prices go down, they can charge a little bit less. So we could change that, but that would have to be added in as one of your one part of your equation. So today you should be able to tell which quantities in a situation can vary and which ones cannot. You should be able to use letters and numbers to write equations representing relationships in a situation. So your homework today is on page 143 to 145, numbers one through four and number eight. However, 
One of the problems I want to do with you right now, if I was in class with you, I would say, hey, everybody, let's take a look at page 143. I want to do number three with you, and I would just do it with you. Um, but because I'm doing this video, I put it right here. We've got a student on the track team that runs 45 minutes each day as part of her training. She begins her workout by running at a constant rate of eight miles per hour for a minutes. And then she slows to a constant rate of seven and a half miles per hour for B minutes. So she starts out a little bit faster and then she slows down a little bit. It says which equation represents or describes the relationship between the distance she runs and her running speed in miles per hour. One problem that I see with this is that the rate is in miles per hour, but both of the times are in minutes. That's gonna be a problem, right? And when we're doing this, we should be thinking about the total distance that she runs is gonna be rate times time equals that distance. But she's doing two different things. That's why all four of these options have an addition in here, but I need the rate times the time that she does the first one plus the rate times the time that she does the second part of it gives me her total distance. Okay, so I don't think that A works because that's just adding up two things together. Um, and we don't know that she ran a distance of 45 miles. That would be a, a really long track workout. B, C, and D all have the equals D part. That's what we think we need here, right? And I need to be able to multiply the rate, the speed, times the time that she's doing this. So uh, I'm thinking that D doesn't really make sense with that 45 minus B. We're going to get that one off of there. I know that 45 is coming from the 45 minutes, but we're not going to use that one. Uh, now we're down to B and C. B looks pretty likely, right? We've got eight miles an hour for A minutes and seven and a half miles an hour for B minutes. But I said the problem is that one of them is in hours and the other one's in minutes. So I don't think that we can take eight times A and say that because that's in hours and minutes, that just doesn't work. So I really like C for this one because they're taking that A minutes and putting it over 60. That's changing it into a fraction part of an hour. Same thing for the second part, B minutes over 60. So that's the amount of time in hours that this student is running. So eight miles per hour for some amount of time and seven and a half miles per hour for some other some amount of time um, equals the total distance. So I am giving you this answer today. Number three is letter C. Good luck with that. And if you need help with anything, feel free to send me an email.